So this is part one of the second viruses lecture given on March 27th, 2020. And in this lecture, going to go over how viral infections and the different types of them affect the host cells that they infect. And we're gonna talk about some terms um, for bacterial viruses, um, as well as viruses that cause cancer. We're gonna compare the life cycles of viruses that infect bacteria. And then we're gonna talk about how a virus can actually cause cancer in animal or human cells. And so what happens when a virus infects a bacterial host? So viruses that infect bacteria are known as bacteriophage. And there are two types of bacteriophage infection. The first is known as a virulent phage infection. And virulent phages are viruses that kill the host cell immediately after they finish multiplying through their life cycle. And this uh, killing of the host cell after multiplication is known as a lytic cycle. And so virulent phages only really have this one option, this lytic cycle as their life cycle option. And what happens with a virulent phage when it infects the bacterial cell is that you can see the phage up here attaching to the outside of the bacterial cell. It can then inject its DNA into the cell. And then the viral genome, which is in red, can be used to synthesize other viral genomes, as well as all the proteins that make up the capsid structure of the new virions. Those virions will assemble and then ultimately be released from the bacterial host cell by lysing or killing the cell and basically bursting out. And those new virions can go and infect other bacterial cells in the same way. But there is another option that some bacteriophages use to infect bacterial cells. And these are known as temperate phage infections. And so temperate phages are specific viruses that can adopt uh, what's called a lysogenic cycle, which is an alternative life cycle rather than just immediately killing their host, they can actually enter into this sort of dormant phase. And the way that this happens is that the phage will attach to the bacterial cell and um, inject its genome in the same way it would to begin the lytic cycle. But rather than having the viral genome replicate and start to make proteins, the viral genome itself can integrate into the DNA of the host bacterial cell and generate what's called a prophage. And that prophage DNA, which is now a bacterial chromosome in blue, plus all of this viral genome in red, is actually replicated and can pass on every time that bacterial cell divides and replicates its own DNA. It's passing on the viral DNA to any daughter cells as well. And so during this process, or this lysogenic process, while the phage, um, temperate phages are technically dormant and they're not making new virions, they can change the phenotype of the host cell that they've infected in a process called lysogenic conversion. And one thing that a phage will normally do, a temperate phage, when it enters the lysogenic cycle is, um, is cause this conversion um, and actually prevent the bacterial host cells from being able to be infected by other viruses and sort of stake its claim on this bacterial host cell. And so temperate phages can stay in this lysogenic cycle for the entirety of their lifespan, but they also have the option to enter into the lytic cycle. And the first part of this entrance from lysogenic to lytic cycle involves a process called induction. And this switch from lysogenic to lytic cycle is usually um, started by exposure to stress um, or other kind of DNA damaging events like UV light, where this viral genome is excised or cut out of that bacterial chromosome. And once the viral genome is cut out, it can then be synthesized, replicated, and then used to make viral proteins that can make new virions, which can ultimately lyse the cell. And so a temperate phage has this option to enter into the lysogenic cycle, but it can also be activated or it can undergo induction and then enter into the lytic cycle as well. Whereas a virulent phage can only stay on this half of the diagram on the left, 
in that lytic cycle. And so there's several advantages to having this lysogenic cycle um, for temperate phages. The first is that the viral genome will stick around even if your host cell is dormant. And so in certain conditions, especially stressful ones, bacteria will decide not to divide. They will shut down protein synthesis. They will stop replicating their own DNA. And if the viral genome is integrated into the bacterial genome, that virus can sort of stay dormant with the host um, and allow itself to stick around within the host until conditions are favorable again and that host continues to divide, which gives it sort of a permanent host. And it can also ensure that when there's a ton of viruses around, there's still host cells for them to infect. And so you can imagine that if there was a very high amount of virions and very few host cells, if all of the viruses entered the lytic cycle, they would infect those host cells and kill them faster than the new host cells would be generated. And those or viruses would end up sort of killing themselves by default, by destroying all of their hosts. And so when viral numbers are higher than host cell numbers, they tend to enter the lysogenic cycle rather than the lytic so that they can ensure there are some host cells around for in which they can multiply even if a lot of the other host cells are killed in the lytic cycle and like ensuring their own survival. Okay. And viruses can also infect um, both plant cells and archaeal cells, but we're gonna next focus on what happens when they infect an animal or a human host cell. And so there are several different options for what can happen to this host cell once the virus attaches, enters, assembles, and then tries to release new virions. The first is um, that the virus can end up killing or lysing the host cells, and that would lead to sort of an acute infection or a short-term infection. There are also some viruses that can cause persistent or long-term infections. There are two different types of persistent infections caused by viruses. One is called a latent infection, and in a latent infection, the virus will attach to the host, enter, and then basically lay dormant until there's some activation of the virus, either due to stress um, or some other trigger, and then the virus will enter into a synthesis, assembly, and then release phase. And ultimately, those cells will get lysed or killed as well. And so both um, acute infections and latent infections end in cell lysis or cell death. But there's another type of persistent infection where the cell will remain alive for as long as it um, normally would live, but slowly release individual virus particles for as long as it lives. And that will lead to kind of a chronic or persistent infection without killing the actual host cell. So viruses are made throughout the life cycle of the cell, they're released, and they're released in a way that doesn't actually lyse the cell and allows it to continue making viruses and continue infecting the host for its entire life. And then there are some viruses that can activate certain proteins and transform a normal cell into a cancer cell. Those viruses that lead to or cause cancer are known as oncoviruses. Oncoviruses uh, typically act by making up proteins that inactivate tumor suppressors in a cell. And what that means is that normally um, tumor suppressors are there to sort of put the brakes on cell division and activate cell death when the DNA is damaged or when cells are sort of beyond repair. And so if the DNA in a cell is damaged, a tumor suppressor will prevent that DNA from being replicated, prevent that cell from dividing and passing on any mutations or any damaged DNA to its progeny cells. Or it will kill that cell through apoptosis. And what oncoviruses do is they basically take the foot off the brakes of those tumor suppressors. And regardless of how damaged or messed up your DNA is, the cells can continuously divide and that will lead to cancer. And some of the typical viruses or oncoviruses that are associated with human cancers can be seen down here in this table 6.1. A couple you've probably heard of um, are herpes virus, as well as HPV or human papillomavirus, which is known to cause cervical cancer. 
through a mechanism uh, like the one above.